Hey, Mr. Smith. Hey, Mr. Robinson. What do you have on your mind this morning? I have on my mind an old classic. Captain America Civil War. Hello and welcome to the podcast, everyone. I am Mr. Wallace Smith. Sitting across from me is Mr. John Robinson. Hello, Mr. Robinson. How are you? Well, Mr. Smith, I'm, I'm doing well. Thank oh. you. Well, good. I'm so glad you're doing well. Uh, we should add, this will probably be the third podcast that we've posted, but it's not the third we've recorded recently. We recorded two, some of you may saw the picture on Instagram. We recorded two yesterday with Mr. Mark Sandor. That was a treat. We've known Mr. Sandor for a long time. Good friends. He was actually staying at, the, at Mr. Robinson's house. And those were a rather, uh, I don't know, did you think we got profound in those? We, we, we definitely dove a little bit deeper than we have on some of the other. Yeah, the ones that we've done for the demo and such. So we thought we'd actually save those a bit. Uh, those would be a little bit longer. And today, instead, I would like to discuss a topic that frankly has been on my mind ever since I saw the movie. And if you have not seen the movie, I'm not saying you have to go out and see the movie. But many of you have seen the movie, and I think there's something we can model here, which is part of our goal uh, here on the podcast, is to model biblical thinking. So I'd like to talk about the movie Captain America Civil War. Now, if you're not the kind of nerd that goes to see those particular kind of movies, that's fine. But I definitely have seen it. You know, I remember when that was about to come out, and... Um... And we, you and I talked about it, and my and I wasn't excited about it because I, I didn't like the idea that the that the good guys were having infighting amongst themselves. Right. With this looming, the various looming threats out there, this is the worst time for them to not be getting along and fighting amongst themselves. But it, it did turn out to have a, a a pretty plausible reason for why they were were not united about it. Well, that that's what I liked about it. And for those who haven't seen it I'm not saying you have to see it in fact this would probably be a great time for disclaimer guy disclaimer guy take it away any discussion that follows should not be considered an endorsement of the subject of that discussion unless the subject is the Bible we endorse that big time thank you disclaimer guy we appreciate you in the movie I want to summarize it for you because this is all you really need to know to understand the point that we're gonna to make today you have uh, what is normally our two heroes have been a hero have been heroes of the Marvel Cinematic Universe up to this point. You have Captain America, very Boy Scout like uh, fellow played by Chris Evans, and then you have Iron Man, uh, Tony Stark played by uh, Robert Downey Jr. And they are at odds about a particular circumstance that has come up because of the collateral damage of all their attempts to save the world or what have you. The United Nations has gotten together and put together what is called the Sokovia Accords, named after a uh, a city uh, in a country uh, in Eastern Europe that fictional, yeah, fictional, of course, Sokovia that that suffered really at the hands of of what they had tried to do, uh, kind of a mixture of actually trying to do the right thing and other th anyway, regardless. So they put together the Sokovia Accords that was meant to take their little super powered team and put it under the control of say the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, you know so that so that they're accountable to someone as opposed to being accountable to no one so you've got in that pair Captain America who does not feel comfortable with that uh, Captain America essentially he's he's just been through a circumstance where he was working for a gov shadowy government organization assuming that they're the good guys then come to find out they were actually the bad guys uh, they were actually uh, corrupted from within. They were. He doesn't even know if some of the missions that he's been on, that he thought were good guy missions, were actually bad guy missions. He he just doesn't know. So he wants to retain that moral accountability to himself. He doesn't want to put himself under the control of someone else when he he doesn't know that he can trust the decisions they're going to make. He wants to retain that uh, moral autonomy, you know, if if you will. Well, on the other side, you've got, and it's really kind of a reversal of the roles for the two characters. You've got Tony Stark or Iron Man. He's normally been the playboy, the kind of fly, you know, by his own rules, doing whatever he wants to do. But he also feels responsible for what happened in Sokovia. It was sort of an outgrowth of his desire to create a, a Ultron, this kind of a robot or something, this this system that would be able to protect the world. 
Well, it goes haywire and ends up almost destroying the world. And and it's the personal accounts of those who suffered under that has, has really struck him. And so he wants to yield to this. He wants to actually allow their little organization, the Avengers, to come under the control of the government so that they're not just acting on their own all the time. They're not just essentially being like the villains are. Just you've got power and you do whatever you want. You know, he's got someone else who's accountable. There are elements of it that I really appreciated as a Christian, and that's what I want to talk about. Again, you don't have to actually see the movie to get this point. But in terms of the understanding that we have, part of what I like is how it illustrated two good guys, two guys who made great arguments for on both sides of why they were right, why their position was the right thing to do and not the wrong thing to do. They, they, they both made great points, and yet overall, neither of them really had the answer. Both of their, both of their solutions to the problem wouldn't work in general. Uh, Mr. Robson, do you feel there's any important part of that story that I've, I've failed to explain? No, you're. Uh, in fact, I was thinking your summary was almost a little too good. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, when, when, it, 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 when we not not having, you know, you have a lot more background in knowing the the comic book lore than I did, and and so I only know the the superheroes and their stories by the most commonly known one. So I found it fascinating at the end, as you hinted at in your in your summary that. You know, if you you figure this this the you know Captain America has a strong moral center, a strong ethic. It's kind of you know nineteen you know early century, first half of the century, uh, United States used to see more of that ethic in right, the country. Right, right. And so you think he's going to be the law and order guy, and yeah, let's uh, let's 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 be on the side of having some uh, organization here and somebody over us and keeping us under you're not under control. Oh, there was an element of that. And Tony Stark being the playboy, you think he's going to go on that? Well, nobody's going to. In fact, what did no one's going to tell me what to yeah, do. Yeah, nobody's going to tell me what to do because he, you know, like you can't have my technology. You know, he's yeah, real proud of right. that. And the role reversal was interesting and and made for well, the reason we're having this podcast today. It was an interesting dilemma. If you look at both their arguments, and and I have to give some credit to a YouTube video I saw about that was actually discussing the movie. The the boys and I enjoy watching these videos that sort of break down movies and the rest. And a fellow was breaking down the movie, and you could tell at the beginning he really sided with uh, Captain America. The idea that, yeah, he wouldn't want anyone to tell him uh, what you can and can't do. He'd want to always be free to do what he thinks the right thing is. And he said what he enjoyed about it was how the analogy to real world dilemmas like gun control. And as he's talking about gun control, he start he, he actually has to pause and say, Well, wait a minute, I'm I'm really kind of in favor of gun control. I do believe that, you know, guns are dangerous enough, we need more regulation. And he said, Okay, well now now I think I need to switch. Now I think I need to I, th- I guess I agree with Tony Stark. I guess I agree with Iron Man on this that we do. And it, you could see even he was going back and forth. You know, both these guys have, have their points to make, but both of them fail if you understand biblical nature. There's no way either situation works. The fact is, Steve Rogers, Captain America, has a great point, which is that you can't trust, you put, put your trust not in princes, the Bible says, and he wants to retain the, the freedom to do the right thing. He wants to retain that freedom to do the right thing and not risk falling into the, uh, the spot that, say, the Nazis would say on trial, which is, I was only following orders. You know, I was only following orders. And he, he, he doesn't want to have to be in a place to say that. But at the same time, he's wrong because how does he know he's always going to make the right call. You really have to appoint yourself as absolutely the pinnacle of moral decision making versus having others who might have a broader point of view, you know, might actually be able to see a perspective you don't. Uh, We don't actually have, we we don't want to be the pinnacle of our own moral universe because none of us are so flawless Mm -hmm. that we're always going to make the right call. We really need others in that sense. And also, as the, the point Tony Stark made to counter what he was saying, I think he made it in the movie, I'm not sure, but what does make you any different than the villains? So many of the villains that they fight 
believe they have the moral high ground, even when you get to uh, Infinity War and, and Endgame and such. You know, Thanos thinks he has the moral high ground. What gives us any more right, as, say, Iron Man would argue, than the villains have the right to decide that? We all should be willing to bring ourselves under the authority of others in that regard. And he makes an excellent point, but at the same time, it still runs up against exactly what what Steve Rogers was saying. But how do you know those above you are, are morally right. right? How do you know that they're going to be any better than you? And you get this vicious circle for which the only solution is Jesus Christ. Yep. They should have titled the movie Captain America Civil War, comma, and by the way, we all need Jesus. I, that probably wouldn't have done as well at the box office. Well, you know, the it was as I as the movie was developing. I mean, the first time I saw it, and I, I kind of understood what the two camps were and quickly on Team Captain America, because for me it was really simple. Who did I have the most faith in to make a a closer to the Bible biblical kind of call? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, a moral stance. Like I had way more. Uh, belief in that that Captain America would make a call closer to what I think should be done than a a collection of people that we don't really know, you know, the United Nations, I guess, and you know, and just which kind of gets into the part that would intrigue me the most. You know, I've talked about this a number of times. So as you as you as you kind of uh, as you talked about just a minute ago, superpowers, okay. Captain America is like a super soldier, you know, he's had this serum and he's very powerful. Well, I never think anything about him being powerful because I'm comfortable with him having that power. And we're talking about mm. fantasy, right. and Civil War, yeah, exactly. or uh, com- comic land, okay? Yep. Um, so he's very strong, he's very capable, but you trust him with that because you trust I, his character. I, I trust him. Like, he's shown over and over in the various series that he's, he's you know... Going to make the right call. That's right. Be a good guy. And Captain, I mean uh, Tony Stark, though he has, he, though he has, um, he has some morality with him in terms of wanting to protect protect the the weaker people mm-hmm. and fight against evil, uh, you know. So anyway, then and so the, to me, then you you whittle it down a little further, getting back towards the Bible. It's like, well, sh- how powerful should a king be? What's the best form of government? But right. at the end of the day, it always comes back to, well. Is the king good or bad is entirely based on how close he is to the godly standard of what's best, and and those are the good guys. I mean, it's like, well, how do you feel about a dictatorship? I don't know. Is he a nice guy? You know, the, the <laughs> benevolent dictatorship that we mentioned one time. Yeah. And so it, it always comes back to the character, and 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 to me, Captain America had the strongest character and moral ethic back, uh, ethical background, and the bad guys didn't. You know. Thanos was interesting because even at times you could even be a little sympathetic to what he claimed he was trying to do, even if he went about it in a pretty terrible Horrific way. Horrific way, right. Yeah. Whereas some of those other villains were just bad dudes. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's part of what made Thanos an interesting character is he was motivated by something that he, he truly thought felt was a good for the universe, even if he was a megalomaniac. I, I remember wanting to write something about uh, Thanos as the ultimate representation of Planned Parenthood, but I, I never 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 got around to it. Um, you know, really, I, I see the conflict between Tony and Iron Man in that movie, and their positions, essentially what God taught in the experience of Israel, which is that Israel had the law. They, they had the knowledge of right and wrong, right? And yet, rarely is there a time that they're not living some kind of perversion of it instead, some kind of corruption of it. To me, what I see in Steve's position, we're kind of retaining the, the individual as the supreme moral mm-hmm. chooser <clears throat> as being the time of the judges when there really was no king over the land. And, and it literally says in Judges, what, 21, 25, other places, that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the kind of freedom that, that Steve is looking to pursue. But... Not everyone is a Steve Rogers. Not everyone is the person who's you know capable of making those calls. And, and who knows if Steve would always make those calls. He's, he's a human, a fallible human person. Well, what was that time in Israel? It was moral chaos. It was just, it was just rampant chaos. And it was a terrible time. God isn't praising the people when he says that everyone did, was right in his own eyes. Well, what is Tony arguing for? Essentially, the king. So you've. 
because really part of Tony's motivation is he feels guilty for his choice and he doesn't want to have to feel guilty for those choices. You can kind of put that guilt off on, on somebody else if someone else is, is in charge. But if you look at Israel, they get kings eventually, but God warns them what's going to happen with a king. He says he's going to he's going to take your kids for his own purposes. He's going to don't multiply wives. It's going to happen. I'm telling you not to do it. And what do you see in the history of the kings? You see the rare good king here and there in Judah. But overall, you see kings that corrupt the country from the top down. So you have Israel conf being confronted by both fallacies. When the people are purely in charge, you corrupt the whole country from the bottom up. When the kings are running the show, they corrupt the whole country from the top down. And neither the Steve position or the Tony position in civil war represents any way to run the world. But without Jesus Christ, who will give freedom, but will give it within a moral law, and he will be a king, he will be a, a good benevolent dictator in that way, but he will enforce the kind of law that maximizes human freedom within that law. Apart from Jesus Christ, there simply is no solution to the dilemma that Captain America and Iron Man face. I just read through, um, usually I, I find I don't read the Bible as much as I study it. And so I've tried to have myself go back and just read through the story flow sometimes. Hmm. Yeah. And I really was struck by Saul, which kind of represents the kind of king that people would choose. And then you get David, which represents the kind of king he chooses. I mean, he very specifically, go, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, sorry, that God would choose. And then from then on out, I, I think Mr. O'Gwen would often summarize, you know, the, the history of Israel is kind of basically recording the consequences of when they uh, acted in a godly way versus not. Hmm. I mean, you know, when there was a good king, the, the, the nation thrived. Um, when there was a bad king, everybody suffered. What's the, uh, what's the proverb, you know, when, when a good king rules, the people rejoice, something like that. And... Um, and it was just fascinating, actually, how few good kings there actually was. Israel had zero. <laughs> Judah had uh, probably five or six, maybe. Yeah. And uh, and what a huge impact that that had. So it's like, are kings good? Well, it depends on what kind of king you have. And yeah. What's his moral compass and where is he getting from? And the nation of Israel had God's laws and statutes and judgments. And, and they just didn't have, in general, the heart in them that was necessary for them to keep the law long term properly. And so that's why, you know, Christ had to come along and right a bit of an oversimplification <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, sometimes you got to oversimplify it i think you got to bring it down to the main point i think well i kept hearing over and over growing up in the church um that the so much of the old testament pointed towards the need for jesus christ and that really was exactly right you know they just didn't have a heart in them that they could obey and christ made a made a great sacrifice and, and made a way so that we could right. have a heart like him so that we could obey them yeah, Mr. Armstrong made that point. I, I remember the part of what I appreciated when I started learning the truth was an explanation for why the, the past was the way it was. And it was, it was God spending these thousands of years helping to teach us things that we'll need to understand forever. And one of those is, hey, I can give a nation all my perfect laws. I can give them exactly the way they should run their society. And it's not going to be enough. You have to have a transformed heart to be able to truly make this world work. And without Jesus Christ living his life in us again, uh, transforming us from the inside, there's nothing we can impose on the outside that is going to be sufficient. Uh, and yeah, I, I remember I remember really appreciating that the first time I learned it. It was it was just knowledge I didn't see other places. Well, anyway, that's that's really why I wanted to talk about this today because that's, that's what we hope to do with this podcast is talk about, you know, I, I doubt a lot of people said, man, I, I can't wait to go see that movie because I want to have a large biblical discussion about you know this digital effects laden extravaganza. But we hope we encourage you, if you're listening, to take a biblical mindset into everything. The Bible talks about in Deuteronomy when it comes to teaching your children. You know, when you, when you, when you get up, when you lay down, you know, when you're walking, when you're standing, when you're sitting, that, that if you're really open to it, life provides you so many opportunities to reflect on things God wants us to understand. And that, that we, we should never really turn that brain off. It really should be kind of going in the background all the time. And it makes, it makes for a richer life. Uh, you know, Mr. Robinson, I know you, uh, you have enough conversations with me concerning discussions with your daughters and the rest. Y'all probably have 
lots of times like that that show up from time to time. Right. I, I couldn't agree more because, you know, when I when I started wrapping my brain around uh, that I was going to have kids and, and you know, and the, and the, the strong admonition in the Bible about really being careful to raise your children and, and teach them godly ways and... and and, I, and in my brain, for some reason, it always starts to form a classroom. Like, I don't know, we're, we're, I'm going to sit down with my kids and they're going to sit in a little chair and I'm going to have like a, you know, this uh, almost like a class explanation. Chalkboard and a ruler and a pointer or whatever. Yes, exactly. But thankfully, I'm not that organized. And so I, I actually naturally fell into the way that the Bible prescribes. I just found as something would come up and it would strike me. And, and you know, I got to give a lot of credit to my daughter Maddie because she was she just always seemed really interesting, interested in what I was saying, and so it encouraged me. But I would always take, whether they fully understood it or not, didn't really matter because it's it all slowly but surely starts to sink in, and you know something would come up, and I'd say, oh well, let me let me I'm, let me tell you my experience with this and why I learned that was a bad idea or whatever, or just things I remembered as a kid not really understanding or wishing I knew sooner. And it was truly all the time. Sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes you're driving in the car, sometimes you're at the grocery store, maybe you see somebody who needs help and, and, and you, you know, teach your kid about, you know, you see, see that old lady over there, she's really struggling with whatever. And we did it all the time. And then as the kids got older, they would bring up things, you know, maybe something that they had mm. seen or watched and, you know, uh, and, and ask a question about it, and I did. I probably didn't always recognize this is a good teaching opportunity, and, and missed more, probably more than I think I did. But man, if I recognized it, it almost didn't matter what we were doing. I would try to stop and take the time to take her um, observation, maybe, maybe it's not even necessarily a question exactly, and take it seriously, and and just let's talk through it. And I always thought it was really fun. And 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 then as the girls got older, we just we were in the habit of that all the time. And we, I thought it was also a good way to connect with your children. And have a really good rapport because if they, if they, if you're connecting with them all the time, they really, you really build a relationship and trust. And they're like, well, when I have a, and think about it when they get to older teens and they're out there making more and more of their own decisions, you certainly hope that they feel like, I'm going to ask my dad about this, or, you know, or mom, mm, whatever. Right, right. But just because you built that long term trust over the years of raising them, they, they're comfortable with you and know, oh, well, when I have a serious question, I can always take it to my dad or my mom, and they don't make fun of me for it. Because you know, sometimes questions aren't asked because you're afraid it's you're going to be judged mm-hmm. on it. And heh, we are always judging. But <laughs> anyway, and, and so that's worked really well for our family, and uh, I, I highly recommend it. to. And this is a great opportunity. You know, Mr. O'Gwen used to say, I challenge you to list any politician that had more influence over American culture, really Western culture, than the Beatles. Hmm. And so movies like this, you know, popular movie stars, musicians, whatever, have a tremendous influence over the youth. And so to, to talk about something like this, I think is actually a pretty good idea. Well, thanks. I, I think if we're not careful, I think because we're inundated with entertainment and we're not saying don't enjoy something as long as you can enjoy it within godly within godly uh, boundaries but if we're not careful the world is desperate to feed us yes. the moral they want to teach us the moral and so we have to make sure we're approaching entertainment media music whatever it is we're having to approach it with our morals sometimes those morals say do not partake of that right but even when it seems like something acceptable they'll still try to you know yep. slip those things yep. in there one recently i thought of uh was frozen which really has a hey ladies you don't need to rely on anybody you don't need you know you don't need a guy to be a part right. of your life you're you're strong and independent and what i really liked and i remember you saying you had a situation like this with your boys very similar what made me feel good was I think it was Maddie, just because she was older, picked up on that. And I like to think it's in part because we talked about it. Like, the themes can often be really subtle in there, and, and, and kids don't pick it up, and so you try to point it out to them when you can. But then when they get older, they begin to recognize it themselves. Mm-hmm. I remember you telling me one time your boys were watching something, and it was some, some kind of some conspiracy theory thing, and yes. they started to, themselves to pick apart right. the, the problems in the, uh, in, the, in the conspiracy. I remember that. It was a, it was a program looking at uh, 9-11, September 11 conspiracies, and it, w- it really did feel good to see them looking and seeing the flaws in, in terms of the reasoning. I think, you know, as we wrap up, I didn't think we'd, we'd go there, but... That is kind of what we're doing, and 
what God is doing with us is reproducing himself inside all of us. He's trying to make all of us more like him, to think like he does, to have the character he does, to, to see the world the way he does. And really, in terms of parenting, we're trying to do the same with our children. We're trying to take what God has given us and trying to reproduce that inside them. So they're asking the same questions. So they're bringing the same set of values. And so really, in terms of wrapping this up and, and what we hope it'll illustrate is one, I think from what you said, uh, please engage your parents in these kinds of discussions, right? You know, please, you know, feel free to to ask your parents, you know, what, what they, you know, we as parents are looking for opportunities to teach you. But at the same time, it's so much easier when your children are looking for opportunities to learn, you know, when, when they're actually looking, hey, you know, mom, dad, what do you, what do you think? Yeah. Or grandma, grandpa, you know, what do you think about this? And then also learn to to practice on your own. I think like things like this, you, you start evaluating as, as a young person, you start evaluating these things based on how you understand what God thinks and how God views things. So you're trying to bring what you understand of what the Bible teaches us in terms of God's thinking to what you're listening to or experiencing. And then you have a, a gift in terms of your parents, in terms of the local minister, to run it by them too and to see what they think. So you, you're able to refine those thoughts over over time and to exercise them. So hopefully this has been kind of a discussion to, to encourage you to do that. And, and I, I think we have successfully finished another podcast, Mr. Robinson. Don't. The, the listeners will be the judge of that. They will. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say this. We finished. They'll decide if it's successful. That's right. Sit and Robinson.